Dark Cast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hello, I'm a sophisticate, and so can you. Is the name of our podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony. And I'm another of your hosts, Sydney. And we're two queer millennials with ADHD. Who have been lying about our own cultural literacy. If you've ever been in a situation where you pretended to know more than you do about an important movie or a piece of literature. Yeah, or like a super cool band. Then this is the show for you. This is a show where we engage with the canon so that you don't have to. Topics for discussion will include such things as... Is Carrie Brownstein the coolest person? Can anyone who likes the movie Chinatown be trusted? Why Tom Waits? Why? All of these questions and more will be answered on every episode of I'm a Sophisticate and So Can You. Available wherever you find your podcast. Hey there, this is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast, and it's not suitable for children. It's a true crime show. I talk about murder. This show also might not be suitable for some adults either. Swearing is my second language. I excel at it. Don't say I didn't warn ya. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. What's happening? On my brief break, did I work on home improvement projects? Yeah, a tiny bit. But there's still so much more to do. On the first couple of days I took off, I was sick. And then after, I just didn't feel like doing it. I got a few handles attached to kitchen drawers and cabinets, and a little more of the cabinet staining done, but that's about it. I spent a good portion of my time writing this episode and working on two more future episodes. It's Pride Month! But the word pride is also considered one of the seven deadly sins in Christian teachings. Out of greed, wrath, gluttony, sloth, lust, and envy... Pride is thought to be the worst cardinal sin out of all seven. Thankfully, there's been a shift in the use of this word, as LGBTQ plus people have boldly reeled it in and made it a motto of sorts for our community. There is nothing sinful about LGBTQ pride or the way we use it. The word's main purpose is to achieve a collective sense of self-worth for the community. Because LGBTQ peeps are definitely worthy of living happy lives without violence and bullying by politicians, by Trumpers, by holy rolling Bible thumpers, white supremacists, and anyone else who holds a hateful agenda against us. Live your truth, I say, and live it proudly, as long as it's safe to do so. Y'all know where to find me on the socials, so let's skip that part this time and get into this episode's case. Oftentimes in the act of a crime, be it a murder, a rape, or an assault, the perpetrator will become overzealous, and they'll bite their victim. For years, so-called experts in the dental field would testify at trials. They would testify whether bite marks match the alleged suspect or not. It wasn't until after 2010 that bite mark analysis became known as a junk science because of its unreliability and lack of accuracy, and that's why it stopped being used as much in the courtrooms. However, prior to 2010, bite mark analysis could make or break a case, and it has put many, many innocent people into our prison systems. Dr. Michael West was an odontologist. He's from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. An odontologist is a dentist who does forensic work, like bite mark analysis, as well as teeth recognition to help identify human remains. Well, good old Dr. Michael West. 
He was an expert testifying for the prosecution in over 80 cases. He claimed to have the science of bite mark analysis cornered. He called his method the West Phenomenon, but only he could perform this new method of matching a flesh bite mark to the actual teeth of a criminal suspect. Only he, Dr. Michael West, could perform the West Phenomenon. Cue the superhero music! Over the years, Dr. West would claim he was an expert on other topics as well. His expertise in the multiple hats he wore were wound pattern expert, trace metals expert, gunshot residue expert, a gunshot reconstruction expert, a crime scene investigator, a blood splatter expert, a tool mark expert, a fingernail scratch expert, a liquid splash pattern expert, and a bullshit spewing expert. <laughs> just kidding, I added the last one. Mostly just because I feel this guy is full of bullshit. I don't care what he says. He seems like the kind of guy who's worked hard to make himself seem very important when he's really rather insignificant and his work is mediocre at best. However, his words in courtrooms with all of his supposed expertise and knowledge, it held a lot of weight. He would tell juries, you cannot see what I see. And the jury would believe him. He is a very large part of why our criminal suspects in this episode were wrongfully convicted. So let me tell you a little about the crimes and the two women who were wrongfully convicted. You may not have a lot of sympathy or empathy for them, or you might have tons. The jurors who saw over their court case had none. The year was 2000, our Y2K year that we've talked about in prior episodes. 20-year-old Lee Stubbs had just graduated from high school the year prior. And as another milestone in her life, she'd just come out as a lesbian at the same time. Lee was using drugs and she was an addict. We've also talked before about how LGBTQ people, they will turn to drugs or alcohol as a coping mechanism. Because coming out at any age, it's not easy. But Lee was trying hard to get clean. She enrolled herself at the Katie Hill Rehabilitation Program in Columbus, Mississippi. While she was there, she met a 31-year-old lesbian named Tammy Vance. Tammy was also an addict. Tammy even admitted that she got hooked on drugs to help her deal with her sexual identity. The two women connected and they developed a friendship. They had a lot of commonalities. They both were addicts. They both were lesbians. And they were both living in the Bible Belt, which is not the most understanding and accepting of sexual or gender identities, ones that stray from the societal norms, that is. So the two women became close, and they even started an intimate relationship together. On March 5th, 2000, Lee and Tammy were being discharged from the rehabilitation facility. They had just completed their entire process, and they were on the road to recovery, or so they hoped. Another woman in the program with them, 21-year-old Kimberly Williams, she decided she did not want to be at that facility anymore. She wanted to bounce and bounce badly. She had talked Lee and Tammy into taking her with them and they said they would. It was getting late after they went through their discharge process. So the three women chose to spend the night in a Columbus, Mississippi hotel. The following day, they packed up what little they had and they got on the road heading towards Summit, Mississippi. Kimberly had a guy in Summit that she'd been dating. The guy was named James. He had recently been in a car accident and he was taking prescription medication, namely morphine pills. Fresh out of rehab and looking to score, Kimberly talked Lee into pulling over so they could buy some beer. Lee did what was asked of her and continued driving towards Summit. Kimberly and Tammy, 
Yes, Tammy, who had just completed her stay and was clean, partook in the beer too. Lee stayed clean. Once at James' house, Lee and Tammy stayed about half an hour, but they weren't crazy about the partying that was going on at James' house. Lee and Tammy decided to leave. As they were walking outside, Kimberly followed the two women and asked if she could go with them. Once again, Lee and Tammy told Kimberly she could. Kimberly was carrying a small black bag. Inside the bag were some of James' pain pills. Kimberly took a couple of the morphine pills and she washed it down with the beer. She offered both Lee and Tammy some. Tammy did partake in the pills with Kimberly. For sure, Lee did not have any of the pills or alcohol. She was the designated driver. Lee drove the three of them to a comfort inn in Brookhaven, Mississippi. Lee checked them in and paid for the room. She went back out to the truck and she helped the other two women stumble to the room. Even the comfort inn desk clerk said that Lee did not appear drunk or high. She just seemed really tired. The next morning, Lee and Tammy woke up. The two women decided that they were hungry and they needed to eat. They tried unsuccessfully to wake up Kimberly, but then they gave up. So they left for a bit to get some food. When they got back, they sat around and watched some TV. Kimberly still hadn't woken up. Lee and Tammy figured she just needed to sleep it off. But Kimberly? She barely moved. Pretty soon she started to breathe funny and then she stopped breathing altogether. Lee and Tammy then tried to wake Kimberly up more aggressively. Still, she wouldn't come too. Freaking out, Tammy and Lee tried to do CPR in Kimberly and they had an ambulance called. The paramedics arrived and they took over the CPR. The police came as well. Tammy and Lee voluntarily gave their statements. Kimberly was admitted into the hospital for a drug overdose. She was clinging to life and then, well, she fell into a coma. As doctors were examining Kimberly's body, they found many injuries to it. She had a swollen breast with teeth marks and scratches around her nipples. She had a swollen vagina, including what looked like a fresh wound. And she had red marks like from a paddle across her buttocks. Doctors completed a rape kit on Kimberly but the results were inconclusive. The doctors at the time felt her injuries were two to four days old. Then Kimberly was transferred to another hospital, a hospital that was better suited to help with her medical situation. She was still in her coma. The doctor at the new hospital noted she had a large cut on her head. It was then determined the cut must have come from the transfer to the new hospital because the cut was not noticed at the first hospital. A few days later, the district attorney, Dunn Lampton, called in odontologist Dr. Michael West. Remember him? He went to Kimberly's hospital room. She was still in her coma, and he examined all of her injuries. A dentist explored her naked body. And of course, he found new injuries with his very trained eye. Dr. West was going to be the prosecutor's star expert. Dr. West claimed he found bite marks on Kimberly that other doctors had missed. Using his method, the West phenomenon, is where he puts on a pair of yellow goggles and shines a blue laser light over the victim's body. That way, Dr. West could see bite marks no one else could see, including other odontologists. Conveniently, his technique couldn't be photographed, it couldn't be reproduced, and it couldn't be recorded in any way either. Plus, only Dr. West could do it. You just have to believe everything he says is truth. Okay, Dr. West, you see things no one else can because you, sir, are an expert. You can tell I really like this guy, huh? Eventually, Kimberly did wake up out of her coma and she would survive. 
Lee and Tammy were brought into the police station for further questioning. They just wanted to cooperate and be on their way to Tammy's home in Louisiana. As the investigation went on, Lee and Tammy were required to stay close by. Several days after their visit to the police station, Lee and Tammy were hit with a warrant to give teeth impressions. Their teeth impressions were then given to Dr. West. Who would make a mold of them? Oh, and the police also took impressions of James and his brother's teeth. Police garnered a warrant on Lee's truck and impounded it for evidence as well. So it looked like Lee and Tammy weren't going anywhere. Except for maybe jail. Police felt like they had enough to arrest Lee and Tammy. They were arrested for a sexual attack and assault on Kimberly. They were also arrested for stealing and possession of narcotics. From here on out, things would just get more bizarre for Lee and Tammy as we get into their trial. But before we go into the courtroom, let's look a little more into the state where all this went down. Because I'm pretty sure the geolocation played a significant role in what went down for Lee and Tammy. Homosexual activity was still illegal up to June 26, 2003. So for Lee and Tammy to be lesbians, their sexual identity was illegal in Mississippi. Quite frankly, I'm surprised that wasn't one of the charges on their docket as well, because it seemed to be a large factor at their trial. Whether it's admitted to or not, church is the law in a lot of these states. Even though here in all 50 states in America, we're supposed to have a separation between church and state. I mean, even today we see church and state mixing. Look at where all the anti-trans laws are trying to be made. Alabama, Texas, right in the heart of the Bible Belt. As of January 2022, the state of Mississippi holds zero laws protecting their LGBTQ plus communities. And there are no laws protecting us from anti-LGBT plus discrimination at all in Mississippi. If you are gay there and you're trying to buy a wedding cake, be sure to find a bakery that isn't anti-LGBT or you will be turned away. You will not be recognized as a tax-paying, law-abiding customer. That bakery will only see your rainbow stripes and possibly the unicorn you rode to the bakery on. In the courtroom of Lee and Tammy's trial, the two women didn't stand a chance with the lineup of witnesses procured by the prosecutor. First up to testify was Detective Jones. He was the lead detective that the women gave their initial statement to, as well as their follow-up statements when brought into the station. Detective Jones is also the one who investigated CCTV footage from the Comfort Inn's parking lot when Lee parked the truck. Here's where his testimony got really disturbing. Detective Jones said that what he saw in the surveillance tape was Lee step up into the back of the truck, lift the lid of the truck's toolbox, and remove a body from the toolbox. She then carried the body into their room. <laughs> okay, that visual for me, I tell ya, that either had to be one tiny body or one fucking big toolbox. And Lee, <laughs> she must have been pressing the weights at the rehab center to get buff enough to single-handedly lift a human adult body from a toolbox inside the back of a truck and carry it into the motel room by herself. The detective said he and Dr. West, our expert witness, measured the latches on the toolbox and they matched up sizes with the cut on Kimberly's head. That cut, no doctor at the first hospital ever noticed. The same cut the doctors at the second hospital decided happened upon transport. 
The detective also testified drugs were found in a black bag in the room, and they were taken by the paramedics with Kimberly to the first hospital. Detective Jones said he personally counted out all of the pills and there were 39 with James' name on the bottle. Next up was James' mom because it was her house where James was having the party when Kimberly, Lee, and Tammy showed up. She didn't have too much to add to the story other than, yes, Kimberly had shown up to her home with two women. She was only introduced to one of those women. The women kept walking from James' room to the porch. Supposedly, they were looking for a tent. And when the women would go to the porch, they'd turn out the light and whisper. The prosecutor used some choice words. He asked James' mom if the two women seemed to be working together. She said, yes, working together. Were they building a house? What does that mean? Well, I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. I had to ask my guest speaker that you will hear at the end of this episode. The guest speaker said, The prosecutor was alluding that Lee and Tammy were conspiring to steal James' prescription drugs and some money in a checkbook and an insurance card. But that's at least one time in the trial Lee and Tammy's attorney did them a disservice. In my opinion, the only thing Lee and Tammy were most likely stealing when they went out to that porch and turned off the lights was a kiss. Because, yeah, they were having an intimate relationship with each other. They're in the Bible Belt. They don't know this James guy or his mom or anyone that lives there. If they were to kiss out in the open, they don't know that they're safe. Well, next on the stand for the prosecution was James. James testified that all three of the women who came to his home had been drinking and that Kimberly was the one that drove because Lee and Tammy were too drunk to drive. Say what? (laughs) Okay, James. And then he said at one point all three of the women were standing in the doorway to his room. Kimberly asked for her mail. He was collecting it for her while she was in rehab. And when he turned to get the mail, the three women disappeared with his little black bag that held his pain meds, his checkbook, his insurance cards, and $302 in cash. Not 301, not 303, but precisely $302. James said he then heard the door slam and his brother went running after the women. But it was too late. They were already in the truck and tearing down the driveway. Next on the witness stand for the prosecution, was the clerk from the Comfort Inn Motel where Kimberly overdosed. She testified Lee came in to get a room for the night, paid in cash, asked for a ground floor smoking room, and she wanted to make sure she could park right in front of the room because she had some things in her truck that she was concerned might get stolen. She said she wanted to be able to keep somewhat of an eye on it. The clerk assured her they had cameras in the parking lot for security purposes. Lee also told the clerk that she had a couple asleep in the car. She had to drag them out and into the room. She said, don't worry, they're not dead or anything, just asleep. Which is probably why it's not such a good idea to make jokes to people who don't know your humor. The next witness was one of the doctors at the first hospital that Kimberly was admitted to. He testified to the condition of Kimberly's body when she was admitted, which, just as a reminder, was swelling to her breast, bite marks and scratches around the nipples, swelling of Kimberly's vaginal area and what almost looked like a fresh wound there as well, and red marks across her buttocks. The doctor then testified that it looked as though the injuries had only been there a day, maybe two at the most. Which is funny because he actually changed his testimony at the court. Because prior at the hospital, 
He said the wounds appeared to be two to four days old. Go figure. Which means it could have happened when Kimberly was at the rehabilitation center. And another spoiler alert, but something to think about. If Kimberly's attack did happen at the rehabilitation center, that could be why she was so hot to get the hell out of there. Why she asked Tammy and Lee to take her with them. Next up for the prosecution, there were the two paramedics. They basically just testified to being the first professional responders on the scene and that they took Kimberly and a bottle of pills they found and transported both to the first hospital. And then we have the star expert witness for the prosecution. Dun, da, da, da. Dr. Michael West would take the stand. He testified to finding bite marks on Kimberly's hip area, her right thigh, and then the other areas the other doctor had testified to where bite marks were. Dr. West's scientific method was to make molds of the teeth impressions he gathered from the four persons of interest, James, his brother, Lee and Tammy, and once the mold had dried and set, he took all four of the impressions to the hospital where Kimberly was. He then pressed the molds into Kimberly's skin, trying to make a match. James, his brother, and Tammy's impressions did not appear to match any of the teeth marks on Kimberly's skin. However, he could not rule out Lee's teeth. The hospital staff at the second hospital also told Dr. West about the injury to Kimberly's head. So Dr. West took pictures of the wound and he met up with Detective Jones. Dr. West was shown the surveillance video of the Comfort Inn parking lot. He enhanced the video several times and testified he saw Lee lift the lid of the toolbox in the back of her truck and remove an adult body and carry it into the motel room. Let me remind you that even in the year 2000, video surveillance would appear grainy. And come on, it's a comfort inn in bumfuck nowhere USA. Do you really think they'd spring for state-of-the-art CCTV equipment, even if it was available? Doubtful. But Dr. West testified the wound on Kimberly's head and the mark on her thigh looked as though it came from the latches on Lee's toolbox. Wait just a minute, Dr. West. I thought you said the mark on her thigh was a bite mark. Dr. West continued to talk on the distance from latch to latch on the toolbox was 37 inches. The distance of the head injury to the thigh mark on Kimberly was 37 inches. Congratulations, doctor. You are also an expert in math. You solved the case. The good doctor also determined, along with his assistants, that a woman Kimberly's size could be placed in that toolbox and removed by another woman. I'm sorry, warriors. Again, I keep trying to visualize this. And either Kimberly is the size of a freaking Barbie doll, or Lee is the Incredible Hulk. But the jury was eating up every last word of Dr. West. That and the prosecutor kept alluding to Lee and Tammy's sexual identities. <gasps> Lesbians! The prosecutor asked one last question of Dr. West. He asked if one might be especially likely to find bite marks in an assault perpetrated by a homosexual. Dr. West replied, It wouldn't be unusual and almost expected. Finally, Kimberly took the stand. She testified she was not injured prior to going to James' house. And she remembered that someone took James' pain pills, but she didn't remember who. And then she remembered nothing after they left James. The jury found Lee and Tammy guilty of aggravated assault, drug possession, and conspiracy to steal drugs. They were each sentenced to 44 years in prison. 
Approximately 10 years later, the Mississippi Innocence Project became invested in Lee and Tammy's case and conviction. In 2012, Lee and Tammy's convictions were vacated and they were freed. Welcome, Valina. Please Thank tell you my so re- much. Oh, hi, I'm sorry, I should give you a chance to talk. I told you I don't <laughs> interview much. So welcome to you and please tell my Rainbow Warriors who you are and a little about yourself and specifically how you were involved in this case. Sure. Uh, my name is Belina Beatty, and I teach at Arizona State University. I'm a lawyer, uh, and I represent people who have been wrongfully convicted. Uh, I'm a queer woman. I'm married to a um, cis woman, and I have a strong interest in representing queer people uh, in general and who have been wrongfully convicted. So I wrote this book, Manifesting Justice, Uh, about two of my clients who are lesbians who were wrongfully convicted because of their sexual orientation. Uh, And I wanted to share their stories, uh, but also just bring to light how um, we can be criminalized for our identities. That's that's an incredible, um, incredible journey that you decided to take. But before that, you were actually a prosecutor, weren't you? I was. How did you do the flip? So I um, went to law school because I had been a rape victim advocate and had represent, I'm sorry, I I was a rape victim advocate and had uh, volunteered to help people uh, who had been assaulted when they were at the hospital. Uh, So I was on call for these hospitals around Chicago and I went to law school to prosecute domestic violence and sexual violence. Um, And I got my dream job. My dream job was to be that kind of a prosecutor and uh, I got to do it. And I realized that a lot of what I was doing was not actually helping uh, victims or survivors, uh, that they often did not want to be part of a trial, uh, part of a conviction uh, that could re-traumatize them uh, and I found myself using measures uh, that were common in my office where we would arrest a survivor uh, and detain them to make sure that they would testify in a case, that what was most important to us was getting this conviction. And so I was really feeling some internal questioning about this and and about whether Uh, I was actually doing work that was helping survivors and victims when a friend of mine uh, who worked at the New Orleans Innocence Project told me about an open position at the Mississippi Innocence Project. Uh, And I went down to Mississippi to interview and to visit for a couple days. Uh, And while I was there, the director, uh, Tucker Carrington, said, hey, why don't you come and meet one of our exonerees? LaVon Brooks, this man who uh, was recently freed. And I said, sure. And then he told me, well, it's uh, his mother's funeral, that his mother has just died. So I was floored that I was being invited to meet LaVon and also to attend his his mother's funeral. So I went and uh, I, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, and he and his family were just so welcoming and inviting and appreciative that people were there for the memory of his mother uh, and to recognize her and lift her up. And that blew my mind. Uh, you know, I had been a prosecutor in a very judgmental mindset, and here were these people who were welcoming me in. Uh, and Levon in particular, uh, you know, he said, I asked him, you know, you must be so upset about your mom passing when you've been in prison for all these years and your mom has fought for you and then you're released and she passes away. And his response had so much grace. And he said, well, she was able to put her hammer down. She fought for me to be free and she saw me free and she could pass on now. So it was that experience that really led to me moving to Mississippi, small town Mississippi, and working to represent people who have been wrongfully convicted. 
And that's that's uh, how you found Lee and Tammy. Yes, yes. So Lee and Tammy ha- had applied to the Mississippi Innocence Project, and I was thankful to meet them uh, and to work on their case and get to know them and get to know their families. Uh, and then they also let me know about other women and queer people who were um, wrongly incarcerated in Mississippi as well. Uh, so they kind of let me in as well. You know, in your book, you had mentioned that you had an averse uh, feeling towards compassion and sympathy for anyone than a few you decide you decided deserved it. Apparently, that's changed for you a lot, and I guess you kind of answered that in the when I asked you about how you were a prosecutor and then you went to help people with the Innocence Project. Do you, looking back, think that was a really good career move for you? Or do you think more, maybe it was just more a good move for your heart and in your, who you are as a person? Yeah, it was a good life move. Uh, It was definitely a good move for my heart and definitely. And, and like, I, I think I got to grow as a person and i Probably the career move, definitely the career move. What am I kidding myself? Definitely the career move was like, be the prosecutor or like do another, you know, DC job. And um, and instead, you know, I moved to this small town in Mississippi and it totally changed my life okay. for the better. Good, good. I'm glad you heard that. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, Do you see more injustices happening with queer women accused of crimes than other populations of marginalized people? So I will tell you that the numbers show a large percentage of um, girls who are in juvenile detention, uh, who, uh, again, are teenagers who are incarcerated, uh, are queer, are um, LGBTQ. Uh, so they're overrepresented uh, among juveniles, and then it's it can be hard to get numbers in the adult population. I think one thing that's important is when someone's sexual orientation matters. You know, when does a prosecutor care whether someone is gay or not? Uh, and frequently, if there's some kind of an allegation of a sex crime, then the sexual orientation of the defendant, if they're gay, will come up. Um, So queer people are more likely to be wrongfully convicted for sex offenses because our identities historically have been criminalized, have historically have been deviant. Uh, I put that in in air quotes for uh, anyone listening. And so it's easier for the prosecutor to make an argument that, oh, well, this person uh, is more likely to be violent, uh, is more likely to be dangerous, is more likely to be quote unquote depraved um, and to commit this crime. So we do see wrongful convictions of queer people, particularly for sex offenses. Got it. Wow. That's crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> I mean, and it's also, you know, if your sexual orientation does matter to a crime for some reason, Like there's an example of a case where someone was charged with uh, fraud, financial fraud. And he said, well, it wasn't me. It was my male partner. Then the court was like, no, no, you can't bring any of that in. Uh, Again, that's just confusing the jury. You can't bring any of that in. And you're like, well, but that's the person who did it. Um, So very relevant to the whole case. Yeah. Yeah. So it's brought in when it's used against you and against your uh, character, for lack of a better word. But when you want to bring it in, you may not be able to. I guess I should ask, why do you believe our court systems are so hesitant to reopen potential wrongful conviction cases? Because our courts and our prosecutors, uh, our judges are built around the idea of finality. They are dependent on the idea of finality. That once someone is convicted, that's the end of a case. They're not going to reopen it. They're not gonna look at it again. And given how many people are prosecuted every single day in the United States, they also argue, 
we can't reopen these cases because it's not efficient. We just have too many cases coming through. So we have to keep pleading them out. We have to keep processing people through. We have to keep moving forward. Our courts have really set up barriers to reopening cases and, and looking at them deeply, which is very sad for me because, you know, if we find evidence that someone didn't commit the crime, that means the true perpetrator is probably still out and who wins from having an innocent person in prison? But we see even with the Supreme Court this month uh, in one of their decisions, there's so much importance placed on finality and ending a case and not reopening it, even if we have evidence that undermines the conviction. How can a defendant be legally and factually innocent, but still get a prison sentence? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, so there's things that are known as hallmarks of wrongful convictions, where we know that these types of things have led to innocent people being wrongly convicted. Uh, so false confessions, where police coerce, uh, interrogate someone intensely, leading to a false confession. Prosecutors not turning over exculpatory evidence. So even if they have evidence that someone is innocent, like they did in Lee and Tammy's case, they don't turn it over. Faulty forensic evidence. So again, like Lee and Tammy's case, the bogus bite mark evidence. There's unreliable evidence that's called scientific evidence that's presented to a jury. And is that and junk science? That is junk science. Okay. Yeah, that's junk science. Uh, that's presented to a jury and jury says, oh, well, this must be reliable. Okay, that's another cause of wrongful convictions. And then bias, uh, just like what happened again with Lee and Tammy, the bias that was able to come in and say, just because they're lesbians, that means that they committed this crime. So these are all ways that people who are innocent can be convicted of a crime they did not commit. Do you think that because they couldn't secure in the rape kit a sperm sample that also had something to do with Lee and Tammy getting convicted for the assault? Yeah, and frankly, for many women who are wrongly convicted and are innocent, they don't have the DNA evidence that can show they didn't commit this crime, right? So a lot of exonerations are uh, men and our DNA exonerations where they do have the sperm in the rape kit, they are able to test it and they're able to say, oh, it's not Jim who's currently incarcerated, it's Bob who was the assailant. Um, but for women not frequently charged with sexual assault, and then as you see here in this case, they're charged with assault, but the prosecutor says, oh, well, the evidence that it was a lesbian assault is that there wasn't any sperm. Uh, they weren't able to, to find it. So that was absolutely held against Lee and Tammy, which is crazy that the lack of evidence would be held against them as well. You right. committed an assault. And it wasn't necessarily that they didn't find any sperm. They just said it was inconclusive. Mm-hmm. Uh. Well, right. And that um, there, there were some problems there that the uh, rape kit wasn't taken until after... Kim, while she was in a coma, had been bathed. Oh, so that would have been at the second hospital. That was at the first hospital. Oh, okay. They bathed her at the first hospital. Well, that was stupid um, of them. Yeah, especially when they saw that there she had swelling in her vagina or near her vagina. Well, that's why they saw it was because they did like this sponge bath of her, and that's where the nurse first saw like some swelling of the vagina, and they saw like a paddle mark across her. But so that's where they first saw those indicators, but it was after they'd already done the sponge bath. So they did take a rape kit, but like you said, it was inconclusive. You know, in your book, you also mentioned that in 2000, Mississippi didn't have a good Samaritan law. A, a reporting person who called in an overdose was dangerously risking their freedom. Even today in 2022, the Good Samaritan law protecting some who report a drug overdose, it's not valid in 10 states. Do you have any idea why? People aren't going to want to report anybody who's had an overdose if they live in one of those 10 states. That's exactly right. They might end up in a lot of trouble. 
Exactly. And I mean, as you and I have discussed, I don't know if listeners have heard this, but uh, Tammy and Lee got 24 years in prison for possession of Oxycontin, for possession of Oxy pills. Uh, And that's because they called 911. Uh, and there wasn't a Good Samaritan law that would protect them. So Good Samaritan laws say, okay, because you helped someone and saved someone's life and called in an overdose, you will not be prosecuted for possession of drugs. Uh, even if you were using, even if you did possess them, because you did the right thing in calling, um, we won't prosecute you for possession. Uh, and in those states where they don't have Good Samaritan laws, you're exactly right. Like, what is your incentive to call in when you could be facing 24 years in prison? And this is where we see, sadly, um, people who are rolled out of cars in front of emergency rooms, uh, who are rolled out in front of a park in a public space where it, these individuals are trying to alert others to this overdose, but they're worried about being locked up. Yeah. Uh, and so you really do see people who are uh, overdosing, who are just, you know, dropped off in front of an emergency room. I have one last thing. We've mentioned your book a couple of times. Could you please tell my Rainbow Warriors the title of your book and a bit about it? Yes, it's called Manifesting Justice, Wrongly Convicted Women Reclaim Their Rights. Yay. Uh, yay. And it's a story about three women who uh, meet at a drug rehab facility in Mississippi. uh, And two of those women, Lee and Tammy, fall in love. Uh, And all three women leave the rehab facility together. And sadly, within 24 hours of leaving, the third woman, Kim, overdoses. Uh, So as you've heard, Lee and Tammy call 911 for help for their friend, Kim. Kim is taken to the hospital. And in a bizarre twist of events, a dentist uh, called Dr. West is brought in to evaluate Kim while she is unconscious in a drug-induced coma. So she's had this overdose, she's in a coma, and uh, Dr. West comes in and examines her entire body naked, completely naked. And Dr. West alleges that he finds bite marks. And it, it's his allegation of bite marks that lead to criminal charges ultimately uh, being brought against Lee and Tammy. Do you know how long Kim was in her coma? That's a good question. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. It was at least a few days because he was able to examine her uh, more than once. Completely naked. I mean, that's the other thing is I, you know, I try to talk about uh, how he's a, dentist. Victims, he's a dentist, how victims are also treated. Uh, and, you know, why would, you know, someone who has had a near death experience and is in the hospital, why would she be examined completely naked by a dentist? So it's horrible. Because he had the West phenomenon. He did have the West phenomenon. I mean, of everything. Yeah. So Dr. West, our (laughs) dentist, uh, you know, modestly uh, created what he called the West phenomenon, where he could shine a certain blue light and he could see bite marks that no one else could see. It's only because he had his yellow goggles on. Yeah, well, it takes a couple different things. It takes being Dr. West, first of all. <laughs> and then it takes these other other special things. Um, but, you know, Dr. West, he led to multiple people being wrongly convicted uh, and put on death row. And LaVon Brooks, the man who I met in Mississippi, who is the reason I went into innocence work and moved to Mississippi, he was wrongfully convicted because Dr. West... Uh, said that he found bite marks. Oh, Dr. West. He's given it up since uh, nobody believes him anymore, right? Well, uh, he has uh, he has given up the practice of uh, forensic odontology and uh, identifying bite marks. He continues to be a dentist uh, at 
the um, local prison. So he actually provides dental care to incarcerated people. people that obviously, he's incarcerated. exactly. I, I'm like, wow, you have a lot of chutzpah and confidence to go in there when you know you've wrongfully convicted people to be able to go in there. And I mean, he's paid for it. He's paid under contract for that work. Is there anything else you'd like the Rainbow Warriors to know? You know, we as members of the LGBTQ plus community are still arrested, charged, locked up um, because of our identities, not necessarily because we've committed a crime, um, but because of how we present ourselves, our gender expression, um, because of who we love. I mean, that continues to happen today. Uh, And I'm so glad that we have pride parades in every state, but we have to just continue to recognize uh, that the criminal legal system still goes after us based on stereotypes, based on tropes, and just to, to be vigilant about that. Well, thank you so much, Valina. I really appreciate you being here with me today. You had such great questions. Thank you. I hope I like shared yeah. enough. Oh, no, excellent. No. And you know, I got to tell the the warriors that Valina has just the best energy. So if you're in Arizona, make sure you take a class from her. Yes, Yay. definitely. Or say hi. You can you always stop by and say hi. Where Are you, you at can... the University of Arizona? Phoenix? I am at Arizona State, which is in Phoenix. Okay. Um, but please like be in touch or people can find me on social media. I'm what are, Felina your, Beatty. Tell us your, your social media where we can find you. My handle is Valina Beatty, uh, V-A-L-E-N-A-B-E-E-T-Y. Uh, and you can also find my email at uh, ASU as well. Wonderful. Thanks again. And you. love you, Rainbow Warriors. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer.